getting invited ahead of myself. Um, the exhibition culminates a year of collaboration between Delphina Foundation, the ICA, Art School Palestine, and the British Council. Point of Departure actually began with a series of arrivals. Three artists and a curator went to Palestine, to Ramallah specifically, with Art School Palestine for residencies there, and a similar group of Palestinian artists and a curator came to London to do a residency program with us at Delphina Foundation. The first iteration of the outcomes of the residencies were shown in Ramallah in January, and that work was further expanded for the exhibition that's in the ICA's theater, which coincided with Shabak, London's Festival of Contemporary Arab Culture. Interestingly, the residencies last summer coincided with another big event in London, the Olympics. And in Rebecca's essay, which will be distributed as part of the e-publication e for the show, she retells the story of being in Ramallah during the opening <laughs> ceremony, and uh, where the crowd had been distributed or given um, these mini flags, which on one side had the Union Jack, and on the other side had a Palestinian flag. That brings us to tonight's discussion about cultural exchange, which is important to us at Delphina Foundation and the ICA. Um, in terms of Delphina Foundation, for the last six years, we have been facilitating artistic exchange with the Middle East and North Africa, which is a continuation of 25 years of supporting artists through residencies, and indeed our future, which, is, um, which sees us expanding our space in London as one of the largest international residency programs in London. Within our work, cultural exchange has often been debated. The notion of cultural exchange and the issues to do with the politics, but also the power dynamic between east-west, north-south collaborations and also the sources of funding and where those sources come from and why they're directed into cultural exchange. And also the problematics and mixed, mixed messages that we often get when one side of the government says, we love what you do, and the other, other side of the government rejects the artists and their, and their visa applications. So certainly Point to Departure um, was also debated as a group among the residents, among the, um, the institutions involved in terms of Public change and also a rejection of nationalist narratives in regards to the UK and to Palestine in lieu of uh, seeking more personal narratives. After all, just as the Palestinian artists coming to London did not want to be defined by the separation wall, the British artists going to Palestine did not want to be defined by the Balfour Declaration. At the same time, we've also seen many positive aspects of cultural exchange, mutual cultural exchange, on artists, on curators, on communities, and on institutions, and indeed the institutions involved with this project, which came from different cultures and different types of cultures. Even the ICA and Delphina Foundation, separated by only a 10-minute walk, have very different cultural, cultural styles of working. But tonight is not about us, and it's not really even about points of departure. It's a much larger and wider open discussion and debate about cultural exchange. And this series of, of events is part of a much larger program that's been supported by Caspian Arts Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that supports and promotes arts and education, and in particular, a scholarship program for young um, uh, students from the Middle East and North Africa. Just, I'll just plug two more events. Um, tomorrow night, um, there's a curatorial tour by Rebecca Hield at 6.30. And on Friday, there's a Culture Now event with Jacqueline Rose and Bingham Nixon. So now my duty is to welcome our panel and to also introduce them. Um, it will be moderated by Mark Rapolt, who's in the middle um, here, who is the uh, writer and editor of Art Review. To his left, I have problems with left and right, <laughs> is Andrea Rose, director of the British Council. And to her left is Omar al Satan. Um, of the AM Katan Foundation, one of the largest um, private foundations in the Middle East supporting <coughs> arts and culture. Um, in addition to um, AM Katan Foundation, Omar is a filmmaker and is also chair of Shabak. On this side is JJ Charlesworth, critic and writer, 
And next to JJ is Rosalyn Nashashibi, the artist, who I think is going to need some introduction. Without that, I'm going to step away and let you begin. <laughs> um, I mean, just by way of introduction to the, about what it is we're talking about with cultural exchange, um, I recently culturally exchanged London for Vienna, where I now live, and was talking with someone there who heard I was doing part of this panel. And they were like, what the hell is cultural exchange? Isn't it what we do all the time? And we were sitting in a Mexican restaurant at the time with our desperado beers and tacos. Um, and I think there's a sense in which we're always told about cities, big Western cities, um, being cultural melting pots and exchange, being a part of what we do on an everyday level. And I think when it comes to sort of umbrella type art projects, there's a sense in which cultural exchange is based on our familiarity with it, this kind of global phenomenon of everything being equivalent and exchangeable, whereas on the other hand, it also separates things. It's very contradictory. So I would say these artists and their work are distinct because they involve an Arab context, and that's something separate and special that then has to be engaged with through exchange rather through a more casual kind of intercourse. Um, and behind that, of course, there's the fact that exchange normally comes with benefits that someone gives and someone receives. And I think one of the interesting things to talk about really is um, to what extent it's those benefits to the, the, the main parts of cultural exchange, whether it's financial, whether it's political or sociological. So I thought um, to start with maybe each of the panelists, maybe not all of them, but Andrea to start with maybe could give us an example of her experience of cultural exchange. Well, thank you very much. And I, just, I would like to thank Delphina for organising this and all of you for coming a hot evening. Um, if I can, um, the reason, because we're talking about art, I might as well use a few slides. Um, I thought I'd start with what, how, you get, how can you get it wrong culturally? Out. You all probably know this artist. I, I'm not going to draw, I'll, I'll try and keep this very, very short. But basically, this picture was chosen by an organisation funded by government who loved it because they saw Moorish art, arches and the immediate assumption was great, fantastic, and go somewhere in the Arab world. We'll buy it for the British state. And, oh, where should we send it to? We'll send it to Saudi Arabia, where they happen to have a wonderful saloon. It went out there, and this was a long time ago, in the days of the telex machine, which, you remember, it used to be like a, a little jackdaw knocking away in your office. After somebody had been to the uh, British Embassy in Riyadh, a week later, the telex machine came back with the message, what's in the sandwich? Um, obviously, for the audience that was uh, in Riyadh, it looked like ham. No one in Britain had actually thought about this at all. The artist, being uh, of deadpan wit, replied, would you like me to paint something else? Egg and cress will cost you 5,000, cucumber will six, <laughs> and so on. And the truth is that cultural exchange is very context-driven, I think. It is time-driven. It has many, many different meanings. Um, I'm going to show you a very few other examples where, uh, and I, I'm very proud to say that it was not the British Council, it was the government art collection, incidentally, who bought and then had to resell that picture. Um, but the British Council also runs into a lot of difficulties in terms of what we are trying to do. Uh, this was sent to the, these two uh, works by David Hockney shortly after he became a rising star having been at the Royal College and picked out in 62 when he was still there as a rising star. He was chosen to go to um, Mexico City at the time then of their cultural Olympics. And I thought you might enjoy this letter, which was um, under embargo for 30 years in secret from the British ambassador at the time. If you can't actually read it, uh, it talks about the appalling nature of being homosexual. Uh, this incidentally was a, uh, a year after the liberalization of, uh, or the decriminalization of homosexuality in Britain. So we felt it was perfectly legitimate to send works that we felt had a a message, and I'm sure we'll come back to the idea of what messages we want to get across. But uh, if you can't read this, uh, I, I will say that I will just let you know that our ambassador at the time said uh, there's a long history of this of national efforts to suppress this vice, and so even our ambassadors in parts of the world where we, the British Council, have been trying to send artists, actually not because of their homosexuality, but because we believe they were great artists. Uh, our own, our own organisation, <coughs> our own people overseas don't feel is uh, a good thing. Uh, this is a rather trivial example, but it was the first opportunity to show Damien Hirst in Paris. 
It just happened to be at the time of the Beef Wars, if you remember BSE, and that these were the only cars to be able to cross the uh, channel at the time. Huge, huge Daily Mail headlines about, you know, why we were exporting cars. So the question of the political, <laughs> diplomatic, cultural context is always rife. I don't think you can ever forget it. Uh, Delphina talked about, uh, you know, the, the nature of what you want to get out of the exchange and Mark II about benefits. Um, I would like to believe that we're disinterested. Of course, nobody is ultimately disinterested. Uh, and uh, this is an example in Iran, just after I went to Iran to, to start cultural relations with Iran in um, 2002, when it was the first time that Britain had been allowed back into Iran after the foundation of the Cultural uh, Revolution there. And they wanted to show British art. That was their request, not ours. It wasn't a question of our showcasing ourselves. Um, and they wanted Damien Hirst. And I felt it would be extremely difficult to show real human bones. No problem in Iran, crucifixion for them, you know, part of their tradition, their religion, fine. What we couldn't show was an artist they had long admired, Mona Hatoum, um, with this work, which is a comment on the Palestinian wars, and that's relevant level for the discussion about our exhibition. Uh, because in Iran, having been through the Iran Iraq war for eight years, anybody who was maimed or killed, and there were two million of them, was regarded as a martyr. So for them, this was a disgraceful slur on their martyrs. So the question of cultural values and context when you're exchanging is a, a very live one for us. And of course you can't show the human body, we can't say bas basically full frontal nudity in Iran, but you can certainly show the body right from the esophagus through the anus internally. No problem about showing deep throat in Iran at all. Um, I want to show you this only because artists and institutions such as mine quite often have different views of what is appropriate to send. Um, you all know Anthony Gormley's field. Anthony Gormley, I, I know this will be on YouTube, came to my office at the time of the Balkan Wars and we were touring this work in what was then Central and Eastern Europe and begged me to send it to Serbia. And I said no. There was an embargo on all except medical and uh, food goods by the UN into, into uh, that part of the Balkan Wars and it would endanger life and limb. And Anthony's remark was, take this as you will, it would be good for people's souls uh, to see something like this. Three, three weeks later, there was the uh, bomb in the marketplace uh, and a large number of people were killed. I felt vindicated, but Anthony rang me up almost immediately and said, you see, if you'd have sent my work, it might not have happened. So, you know, different takes on what art might or might not do. Martin Parr, uh, this is a view of Britain, uh, New Brighton, which is uh, just north of Liverpool, been all the way around the world, we've sent it everywhere. Where can we not show it without outrage? Britain. We showed this in our Manchester office huge fuss from our own staff who felt that this was an outrageous way of showing what Britain was like because they said it's not true. Well, you know, I don't think that it's even if we're funded by the state, it is the job of a disinterested state to show national geographic views. What we want is truth, not propaganda. And my final point is it's all very well showing British art or overseas, but really the, the world has changed, the game has changed. It is very, very important, I think, for other voices to be heard here. I don't think the case, the, 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 the case for showcasing art overseas is made unless you can really have a partnership and a collaboration. And that means letting artists' voices from other places be heard here. I'm showing you this as an example because uh, at a time when Russia had thrown the British Council out uh, five years ago, uh, we tried, actually didn't try hard to do this because of that reason, but it happened to be in 2011 the anniversary of the fifth, the 50th anniversary of the first man in into space, Gagarin, and I brought this statue uh, actually next door to the Mall. Uh, involved a huge amount of negotiation with all of the Russian authorities, and I, I think it made a real difference for the Russians to believe that we appreciated their achievements. We could show Turner, we can show Ruskin, we can show Whistler in Russia, but it makes far more impact for us to recognise the cultural values of other people at the same time. Sorry, I've taken up a long time from my fellow panelists, but that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. Sam. That way, Sam. <laughs> JJ, would you like to... Uh, have okay. you been culturally exchanged? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, 
uh, as, <coughs> as a critic working in the UK, I've never actually, I mean, artists get to do these things a lot more, uh, and that's perhaps a, a kind of issue about funding. I, I realize I've never actually been on a formal, or been involved in any kind of formal uh, uh, cultural exchange within visual art. Um, but I do realize that um, very early on I married an Israeli, um, and when I got to know the Israeli uh, art scene, it was uh, an art scene completely obsessed and sent or very much tied and, and uh, orientated towards uh, European and American um, contemporary art. Um, and so there's already something which I, I, I kind of noted there was that the, that the issue of what, what it means to be uh, to, to, to assign difference to, to oneself and to um, those that we, we you, you correspond with or dialogue with is is deeply a matter of intention, uh, culture, and politics. It's not pre-given. It's something which is uh, can be relatively fluid or at least open to change and open to, to, to context and condition. Um, I say that also partly because I noticed that uh, I've been to see a, a very good show. I thought at uh, David Roberts Art Foundation, which is currently I think still on. Uh, called Friends of London, which is a uh, very interesting archival exhibition done relatively, uh, not very very well done and with, with very few resources in fact kind of assembled, but it's fe effectively a show that uh, catalogues a very minor moment in the London, the history of the London radical art scene, or the, the kind of, uh, it's hard to kind of describe it, the art scene, the alternative art scene in London in the early 1970s, the late 1960s and early 1970s, when it happened to be the case that a number of artists from Latin America, uh, for various reasons, uh, fetched up in London because of the number of um, because of the political situation that was emerging in Mexico, Argentina, and Chile between sort of 68 and 70, 72, 73. Um, what's really remarkable about that show is that um, the type of art which is being which is presented. Uh, in, in very few, in, in very, has very little sense in which it's uh, kind of culturally or, or geographically located. Okay. That's to say that these artists were part of already a very kind of open uh, and migrant and uh, nomadic, uh, effectively counterculture within, uh, within Western Hemisphere art, as it were, uh, a set of relationships which, uh, between art centers in Europe, uh, London, Paris, uh, New York, uh, and uh, scenes in Sao Paulo, um, uh, Buenos Aires, and so on. Um, and what's interesting about those, uh, that example is that it, sh it presents the possibility, or presents the, the historical actuality of uh, artists from different uh, parts of the world, from different cultures, from different uh, nationalities, uh, all identifying themselves according to each other rather than where they come from. That's to say that these are artists who, who operated in a, that kind of very peculiar international um, uh, artistic cultural scene that came out of fluxus that uh, had uh, that uh, it, uh, formed itself around kind of uh, uh, nascent or emerging conceptualism, um, and which, of course, because of the relationship between um, Latin America uh, and Europe, around particularly around the strand of uh, of post-war constructivism or neo-concrete art, which has its root, you know, which has its roots in. in uh, in, in Europe, you know, pre-war modernism in Europe, uh, partly because of a history of exile, uh, emigration, and so on, you found yourself in a situation where, where you were looking at a show uh, that uh, simply does not correspond to, to, to contemporary notions of, of uh, exchange uh, around, defined by criteria of culture, by, by a criteria of, of cultural identity. Um, so, it, in order to kind of just point that point that towards this discussion, it strikes me that what I'm interested in is flow and openness within exchange, and that I think exchange, cultural exchange is going to happen because difference exists. Um, uh, I, I'm a multiculturalist, but only in the sense that I think you should be interested in the best that every culture has to offer, and finally it will end up as one kind of culture. I'm not interested in identitarian multiculturalism where everybody privileges each other's difference. I find that. Uh, bit of a, a roadblock. Um, but the point being, I think that there are two kinds of a cultural exchange that one can talk about. One which is highly formalized and is effectively the, the, the plaything of, of uh, other agendas, politics, ec economics, and, and the diplomacy which comes out of that. And there's another thing which is a kind of uh, 
I don't know, it's not quite utopian, but it's a, a, a kind of optimistic concept of internationalization. I mean, it, it certainly needs to be said that we need more of that at a time when actually uh, controls on migration, controls on the possibility of exchange between cultures is actually becoming more and more formal because it's becoming more and more administered by states that wish to spend their time keeping people out of countries rather than letting them cross borders. Uh, so uh, an example like the David Roberts Art Foundation show, uh, Friends of London, is remarkable because it shows London to be a place where people were coming and going very easily. Uh, and when you think that this is supposed to be the 70s when we're all supposed to be British and racist and xenophobic and everything, curiosity, the curious aspect of it is that the, the possibility for movement and exchange was much more informal and spontaneous than it possibly is now. Uh, so those kinds of issues, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind uh, uh, kind of developing a bit further. Anyway, there we are. Maybe it's time to bring Rosalind in. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you feel when your work is framed in terms of your cultural identity, as opposed to sort of being taken as a sort of coherent object in its own right? Um, I don't think I've really found that. I've sort of been subjected to that. I mean, very early on when I did Bex Futures yeah. here, um, 2003, there was a lot of interest because I'm, my name's Palestinian, my father's Palestinian, my mother's Northern Irish, and I'm from England, born in England. There was a lot of interest in the idea that this here was a Palestinian artist. And because I'd grown up here and I don't speak Arabic, although I have visited Palestine many times, I didn't feel that that was my identity. Obviously, I couldn't. So I sort of, at that time, avoided anything that kind of bracketed me in that area, probably to a quite extreme degree. Yeah. But now I wouldn't because I'm more confident in who I am and what I do. So I'm open to different aspects of my identity. And I think that identity is this sort of never-ending kind of question. Um, so, so yeah, there was, when there was a lot of media interest around that moment, I had to sort of, I felt I had to sort of avoid all those projects that came up, whether they'd be in Lebanon or different, we want, or Channel 4, came to me at one point and asked me if I would be a kind of news correspondent, we just go and film people's lives and it would be on Channel 4 News and this kind of thing, and I rejected all of that. But, um, yeah, I'm much more open to not worrying yeah. about these things anymore. You don't worry about the confusion between who you are and what you do in some ways, or do you keep those things, do you think those things are one and the same? As an who artist? I am and what I do? Yeah. I mean, there's always just this huge space, I suppose, between what I think about who I am, what my life is, and what my work ends up looking like, and that's also in play. I mean, I've had, um, I guess I've had some experiences similar to, one experience certainly similar to what Andrea was talking about when I was in Sharjah Biennial, um, 10th Sharjah Biennial. Um, I made a work which had image, had photographs of men sort of from the waist to the thighs, but they were closed. So images of kind of jeans, men's kind of legs and crotches as part of um, the work. And nothing sort of came up about it, had the opening. And then it sort of, I don't know if it was a few weeks later or some little bit of time late I heard, somebody I knew had been and gone in and there were no images there. And I subsequently found out that there was a work next to mine that had caused a big scandal in the Sharjah Biennial, which was a work, I think, commenting on Algerian culture rather than Emirates yeah. culture, which had graffiti that was of a sexual nature and of a religious nature, kind of side by side. Um, and when that happened and, you know, a big scandal had erupted about that, the invigilators had decided to take my work down as a sort of preemptive strike just in case. <laughs> which I thought was quite a funny kind of <laughs> idea. Because it was the, actually the place where the invigilators all used to sit, and they were kind of young men, and the whole work was about this sort of young masculinity yeah. in the Middle East as well, in a way. So, um, so yeah, I mean, but most of my experience have been of a much more kind of subtly sort of graduated thing where I'm, I don't feel, if I go particularly into somewhere in Palestine, I feel neither that I belong there nor that I'm on a cultural exchange from Britain. It's, it's yeah. a grey area for me, so I can't really ever feel... I mean, I think when I went on a British Council kind of show in Mexico, I felt, yes, I'm here now, I'm a sort of 
we're a wall of like British representation at this point doing a show um, and that felt more formalised but I haven't had many of those experiences and Omar now's the time well, <laughs> um. thank you sorry thank you for waiting um, well I, I think I'll talk about two things that we started doing cultural exchange because we were working in a place which didn't have it and um, we didn't we were exchanged generally, whether economic or the freedom of movement or the freedom of ideas was just non-existent um, or very restricted by military occupation and um, by other issues, uh, internal issues. Um, so for us there was really a, no question about the, the need for this and that um, and maybe naively that this is un bound to be a beneficial uh, process um, that will open a society up to new opportunities that will allow people to travel and to meet other artists and, and, and um, <coughs> other colleagues and, and other professionals and to develop their own skills. So we kind of saw it as a process of cultural, economic, um, social development, wrongly or rightly, I don't know, but I think rightly in the sense that it really is a, a very, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a holistic process. I don't think you, you do either thing in isolation of the other. And I think Aaron used the term the balance of power is very much in our minds when we do this because um, we're obviously dealing in a world which is uh, where especially young people feel extremely disenfranchised. And so uh, whether it's in Palestine or the Arab world generally. And so almost seems uh, indecent or immoral even to question whether this is a, a positive or a negative thing. That of course it's a positive thing to, to be able to, to, to provide opportunities. But that doesn't mean that it's an innocent process. Mm -hmm. and it is rife with issues not only of power but also of the role of, of, a, of a private foundation and the ideologies that under uh, write the process of support um, the frameworks within which the, the, this process becomes possible. And, um, and it's a very, uh, very uh, complex process, but I have no question in my mind that it's an extremely positive one. I know for a fact that um, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, we met in my office with a group of about 30 or 40 um, artists from the UK or based in the UK who were keen to do work in Palestine and uh, the resulting energy from that, and I don't think it's just that meeting, but it's the resulting energy has been fantastic in the sense that, um, in a way, it's kind of the background to this exhibition. Without it, without that energy and that meeting point, um, I don't think those exchanges would have been possible. Um, and uh, the, the key is to really have the intellectual rigor to look at the artwork in its context and also as artwork and to, to tr try and distance yourself from the kind of process, I think you called it the formal process, but it's actually not just formal, it's, you ha it's logistical really, because you have to get these things to happen, for them to happen. And somebody has to pay for it, and somebody has to do the legwork and so on. And I was really faced with my, my naivety when we came up with the challenge of launching and doing the Shabbat festival this year because I naively thought of course look at our success in Palestine this should be so self-evident for all the Arab countries to do it and to support this festival without even asking a single question and to just send me a check without even you know asking you know and so on and of course it was not at all like this and um, we had immediately issues, um, whether uh, political, whether visa issues, you know, uh, two, two of the poets weren't allowed to come, one of the, one, one of the curators had visa issues as well. But also, it's clear that the relationship of Britain at the moment with the Arab world is so, so complicated and so, um, and has been so terrible, um, that we cannot function naively as if this is not happening at the same time. And um, um, one of the challenges we had was to, to, to steer in this minefield a pathway that would reinforce the 
the, the, the positive aspect of exchange, um, of peaceful exchange, of uh, uh, equitable exchange, uh, while also being conscious of the power relations that govern that process and the financial process. Um, and finally, I would say that um, we kind of succeeded, but uh, but we haven't really because the um, UK is a very dirty player in the Middle East. And but how do you measure success? Well, that's what I mean. That's why I'm, I'm saying this in a way as a, as a question almost. But the success, in terms of, does it affect? Does the cultural exchange affect diplomatically? Uh, it, at the moment, the evidence is pretty negative. But on the other hand, I know that, for example, the diaspora in the UK, the Arab diaspora, is much, much uh, strengthened by a festival like Shabak, and its profile is much higher than it used to be. And uh, I look forward to much more, um, uh, you know, much more happening uh, on that on that field. So in that sense, it's a success. Whether it's affected in a diplomatic way that we want hope. And I'll just end with one, uh, now that it's finished, I can say this, but pretty horrific story that I didn't share with anybody. At the opening of this festival, we had the mayor, who's supposed to be our patron, come and give us a lecture about camels and how we enjoyed a visit to one UAE sheikh who shared stories about, which is fine, but it's really not what we had in mind. And, and <laughs> 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 And so I think this game on YouTube forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he can hear it. He's not going to be mayor next time. <laughs> well, he's lost the Arab vote. <laughs> so, Andrew, is, um, is cultural exchange just a way of papering over political and ideological cracks? Uh, I, I don't think it could, even if it wanted to paper over um, those sorts of cracks. I'm, I'm interested in, you used the word framed, I think, and Rosalind too, and... JJ talked about the period of the 60s and 70s. A, a, wise, a wise government, I think, would always want to believe that it can't control art and it shouldn't control art. What it should do is to enable a climate and a culture to develop which enables artists to do what they want to do. <coughs> and that is what we should be exchanging and supporting. Um, we live in a... And, and possibly in the 60s and 70s, when you talked about the... There wasn't any particular financial benefit for artists coming from Latin America to do what they did. I mean, we are living in a time when the whole of the public sector is under enormous public scrutiny. I mean, even today we learned that the Royal Mail is about to be privatised. And all public institutions are much... The, the arm's length to government is very, very much shorter than it was. So for those of you who've seen the big posters around... Britain or anywhere around the world, which is called the Great Campaign, that is government directly through the Cabinet Office saying we can promote art better than institutions like ours and we want to brand it great. I, I can't think of a more insensitive way of saying that what happens in Britain is worth sharing in the world than saying, you know, to, to, to anyone in the world, we are, we are great. So, Why we put them up in the British Council offices? We were we are forced to by most British Council offices are funded through the Foreign Office and they are forced to and it's a really a weakness of the British Council that it can't reject um, it can't it can't reject that because our funding comes from uh, government and of course when your funding comes from government there are constraints and it's one of those um, balances that you have to one of those judgments you have to make about to what extent you go with government objectives and to what extent you can you, you, you can operate without them. I, in my particular case, in the British Council's case, since 9-11 the focus has very much changed from working in <coughs> Europe where after the war the whole emphasis was to support um, the development of Europe after the fall of fascism. Uh, after 9-11 the emphasis, that what that, em that emphasis means is basically we have no money other than for where the government wants us to work. In the, in the more globalized parts of the world, so China, India, Russia, Brazil, the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, rightly, I think, have, have the lion's share of our money, and Europe has none. Um, but that means we must work in those countries. And you talk about framing. Yes, we have to frame to the extent that we have to work in those countries. What would be ideal is to be able to say to us is we will provide you with the funds to go and work in those countries and do what you want. 
Um, but then we also have to, sh I don't want to get into the whole sort of government economics and what you have to show government, but basically for every single penny that we give, we have to show a result. There aren't any results in the world of um, speculative, curious, meditative, reflective uh, enjoyment and knowledge of the world we live in. That's what artists are here to do. It's their job to do that. If we can encourage artists of wherever, whether it's Britain or uh, America or Africa, to be able to do that and to share the results of that with others, I think we'd be doing a, a very good job. It's just very difficult to persuade government of the same. Um, sorry. No, go ahead. I, d I mean, I, just to carry on from Andrea's point, th there is also a danger of co-optation. I mean, artists can be co-opted and artistic institutions or cultural institutions can be co-opted for ideology, um, uh, sometimes wittingly, sometimes unwittingly. Um, so I think that's why it's, to go back to this issue of the, the power relations, why it's very important, both for artists and people working in this field, um, writers and filmmakers and so on, to be very aware of, of their relationships with powerful, um, with their own status, you know, their own power, because they acquire a certain power when they become known. And um, with the, um, the issues that they engage with. I mean, it's, it's almost, um, uh, um, I mean, for example, I'll give you an example. The, um, the, the world of the, the Palestinian cinema, which um, has become very fashionable uh, recently, it's not always clear to me that um, many of the films in this, in this um, cinema are actually um, uh, bothering anybody. And, 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 and sometimes it seems to me that they're being used as a kind of token is in a tokenistic way to say, oh, here, we're doing you a favor, giving you a prize here and there. You can just shut up about the rest sort yeah. of thing. So we need to be careful about that. Similarly, you know, there's a very long argument, and I'm not sure this is the place for it, about the pros and cons of the cultural boycott of Israel, which um, conflates these issues. And, um, you, you know, it, it, uh, but again, uh, a lot of artists will refuse to engage in artistic projects with Israelis, Palestinian artists, because of the power relations. Whether it's the refusal is actually a good idea or not is is debatable. But I, it, you know, it, it, we're never absent from the pressures of reality, and when we pretend that we are, even when we say we want to stay um, aloof of them or to stay independent of them, we're never really. But they're never very far. They're always at our doorstep. I think Omar might have set up the answer for you a bit there. But um, <coughs> do you feel that you're under these pressures? Do you feel that a lot? that you have to be aware about becoming a pawn in someone else's game, let's say? Uh, well, I, the way of having money, I mean, I, that was the way I didn't and still don't have market for my work, so that was the way I, um, and it was a fantastic way of, of being somewhere where I could work. Um, before that it was signing on you know I mean actually it's all that was that's the way a lot of artists have managed um, and you come across these sort of very incongruous situations sometimes and you obviously are aware more and more aware of sort of political agendas but at the same time um, the control on what I have I've never had any controls on anything that I've done this one incident where my work for literally two days was taken off some trees as like people a bit worried about offending someone fine you know I have not had that experience I have sometimes made mis sort of found myself involved in something that I didn't agree with because I wasn't aware of yeah. you know what it was um, and that's my kind of error you're not sort of wandering around in a permanent sense of paranoia about the no, context. No, not at all. No, because I choose my context, and I, you know, I. I mean, I don't choose them. I, you know, I'm happy if I yeah. <laughs> if I'm offered them, but you know, I, I then am more or less aware of what I'm going into most of the time, and I don't try to go somewhere and put the world to rights with the work that I'm going to make as well, and you know, try to sort of make some sort of summary on the situation that I find, which. Some of this kind of, particularly biennials, have, as we know, sort of produced a sort of art which is like, okay, we'll go to Sharjah and we'll make a comment about the fact that, you know, the appalling conditions of the workforce who are coming from India and Pakistan, and, you know, and, yeah. and this is something that will take a few months and we'll go. 
So, the, I mean, I think there's political questions on, on the sides of the artist's activity as well and what they're wittingly kind of going into and, and in the end, yeah, maybe not raising questions, maybe pleasing everybody in a way that they feel sort of cleansed by this activity, the state that they're going into and the state that sent them there. Um, but I tend to sort of... Um, I mean, I suppose like most people operate from a very particular personal perspective and then open out to things and go in quite intuitively to these situations, but I don't, yeah, I don't try to kind of sum up. <laughs> JJ, do you think that um, cultural exchange is one of the ways that um, pushes forward the suggestions that culture or fine art or visual art can fix things? Well, I mean, you know, don't forget that a lot of artists think, think that they are, well, lots of artists make art that is a form of political intervention, right? I mean, lots of artists are partisan. Lots of artists take positions. Lots of artists produce art which uh, is by no means uh, ambiguous about what it considers, what, what, what position it takes on many issues. Um, similarly, uh, you know, people are partisan when they take up uh, stances like, for example, cultural boycotts. I mean, you know, in my opinion, uh, you know, artists and creative academics and artists and, and people who uh, cherish the broad uh, nature of human knowledge and human culture should not be in the business of stopping people from uh, uh, being able to exchange that. I mean, that's not just a partisan issue about whether I, I, I'm, I stick up for Israel or not. Um, I just don't think that people who are involved in human creativity should be in the business of stopping others uh, from circulating. I mean, th 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 there is a big issue here, which is that, I mean, it's in the background here, it's the difference between civil society, which opens up opportunities between uh, nation, uh, nation states, and nation states that uh, handle or, or kind of direct uh, the flow of exchange. Okay, there is a big difference. I mean, you know, Omar is, is pointing to something quite important, which is the uh, very distinct uh, difference between civil society institutions, that's the ones that retain a degree of independence in terms of their resources and their agendas, Delfino would be another one, um, and, and states and their interests and agendas. Right? So um, that, you know, there is, a, there is an important aspect there because it's working outside of the script laid down by uh, uh, state, stated agendas. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, e it's easy to talk, to lecture other people about uh, other countries about uh, you know the lack of cultural openness, but uh, on the flip side is that we have now uh, one of the most uh, onerous and restrictive visa regimes for uh, artists there has ever been in this country, right? To the point where you know colleagues of mine have been campaigning, uh, re you know, uh, very very kind of uh, 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 insistently against this uh, awful thing that we have now, the visa, the, the points-based visa system, which has had quite catastrophic effects on the possibility for uh, foreign artists, musicians, uh, performers, visual artists, to come here uh, at the invitation of organizations here, right? So, um, uh, you know, the Manifesto Club, which I'm affiliated with, has been doing a very good job at forcing the government to back down uh, on the, the way in which it has blanket imposed its visa, its point-based visa system, uh, without exceptions for, for, for artists and academics, right? Now, this is a, you know, this is a serious issue. It is easy to talk about uh, the lack of democracy in other countries, and it is easy to, to, to uh, pontificate from the p perspective of uh, Western governments about the, our tolerant values and our love for democracy and all this stuff. But the flip side of uh, cultural dialogue is that you need human flow. Yeah? You need the capacity and the freedom of movement for people to come and go as they please. Right? And that is not something that we are particularly uh, 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 we can be particularly proud of at this at this stage, right? So that's another point to throw in there. It's not just a cultural issue. When we talk about culture, we're talking endlessly about the ways in which political, legal, uh, and institutional <coughs> factors uh, come to bear on it. So you know, if you, I mean, I've, do you think, I'm going to leave think it there. One, one way of answering that is to also say that perhaps the I, I, and I'm not making a judgment. I don't know, but perhaps the the, the cultural sector in the UK hasn't actually engaged enough against the growing xenophobia that we've seen in the in the polls 
I mean, maybe that's also a failure. That, I mean, our failure to to engage and repost um, uh, politically, to take a stand politically um, against, um, uh, on the one hand, a, a political culture that's veering to the right, and on the other, a political culture in government which is veering to a greater bureaucratization of diplomatic relations. So the decisions about artists now are not made, I know this for, from experience, they're not made by the cultural attaché yeah. or the, the, the visa at the consulate, they're made by some machine in Jordan for Syria, Lebanon, Palestine and, yeah. uh, you know, and Egypt and nobody can really appeal because these are machines that have, you know, you know, they, they, they have point systems. I think that's, I mean, just to, just to respond very quickly to that, there, there are several points. First of all, I think that, you know, governments, our government, many governments have become uh, increasingly philistine about the, uh, the role that culture can play, right? The, the big debate that we've had in this country for ten, 10 years now around the notion of instrumentalism yeah. uh, is, is actually, you know, I think very poisonous. Um, you know, it needs to be continuously argued um, that culture is not a weapon, culture is not a tool, culture is not an instrument. Yeah? Except the problem is that every time you, um, you face down the argument, you, know, you win the argument with politicians and government, they tend to go, yes, but. Yeah, we agree with you that art for art's sake and art is great and, and the culture is wonderful, but, but uh, it's still instrumental, we're still going to use it instrumentally. Maybe that argument is in itself faulty. Because well, I would say that art is instrument or can be instrumental. Well, if it have to be. Yeah, but the point then is, if you're in, if it's instrumental, then then uh, be explicit about your instrumentality. It, yes, be course. explicit about being your your politicality rather than something else. I mean, I think that it's it's, it's I would be very careful to talk about the, the lurch to the right and increasing xenophobia. You know, it's it was a Labour government that uh, cranked up immigration controls. It's also liberals who uh, uh, demand controls on, a, you know, a cultural boycotts on people they don't like, right? So there's the, the you know, xenophobia, right-wing populist xenophobia is, is something of a specter, but, you know, it can, might be seen as something of a, a, a specter. It is at least not, it's just as so much of an, an issue to kind of point to the fact that liberal and left-wing commentators and influence for, and opinion formers over here are very happy uh, to mount effectively campaigns of vilification against this or that state. Right? Yeah, but that's I a mean, different issue. Well, I mean, that's a complete, I'm sorry, that's a non sequitur. That has nothing, it's we're talking about the right. rise in the right, in, uh, regardless no, of whether it's a, the Labour Party or the Tories, well, in the political sphere in the UK. All I'm saying is I would not just point to the idea of some kind of notional xenophobic right. There is a different kind of intolerance of a lot of organisations in this country is that everybody kind of go, grumbles in the background, but then everybody uh, 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 kind of panics and, uh, and basically welches out the last moment. So many, everybody I know in an arts organization says, isn't it terrible you have to tick box, isn't it terrible all these policy agendas? But nobody actually turns around and goes, well, screw you then, right? So um, the fact is to that you To some extent, JJ, well, I mean, it answers two, two questions to your argument. One is um, you're saying, you know, don't governments have too much power or can't art affect governments? Answer is no, it doesn't really. I mean, I think we should be a little bit more modest about our, our aims. Politics, history, economics affect the way states interact with one another. What, what art and culture can do is slightly affect and change the atmosphere. I wouldn't be grandiose about the enormous ambitions that art alone can do. It can only do it hand in hand, I think, with other things. But also, uh, and to answer your question, I think actually the cultural sector has done a pretty good job by standing up to what might have been much larger cuts to the D DCMS's budget. Um, and that has been not the politicians, it has been our you know, cultural leaders yeah. who've actually made an enormous difference by not so much instrumentalizing but pointing out the benefits socially and to civic society about um, uh, the arts in general. So. While, while on the one hand I think we can't say, you know, if we had more art it would change so we wouldn't have wars, which is sort of simplistically boiling down part of this argument, um, it, it, it can't. But I think if you think of societies where there is almost no access and there is no funds to help, no funds to help artists, I mean you might think of Romania 30 years ago when it was an entirely closed society. Um, I don't think it's so terrible that governments have funds if they use them wi wisely. 
But we are in a very changed position. Actually, we're talking about governments, but there's an enormous, enorm I don't need to tell you, enormous dynamic from the grassroots. Exchanges happening at every possible level, people to people, and independent of government, through internet, through all sorts of the flow mechanisms that you're talking about. And it, it, I, I think Rosalind's right. If our artists are far too canny and sensible, I think, um, to be bamboozled into thinking they're going to be stooges of government if they accept government funding overseas. Most government artists I've known who've taken our shilling uh, do with it as, as they want, and that's how they should behave. Mm. There's a question. Uh, I'm sure British Council's pivotal in the whole exercise. I'm also sure, though, that they should have a good endowment, lots of money, and they should have lots of people like brave and courageous and pinpointed the good things the British Council has done. But as someone who's been labelled twice as politically unacceptable, uh, once when I went to China in 82 and I was in the company of Joan Faithful and the director of the National Film Theatre at the time, Jesse Hardcastle, and Marganita Lasky, the head of the British Council wouldn't see us because we were politically unacceptable. What was the reason? Because the only way we could get to China in those days was through the, the China, Britain, French Society. And they were an organization which council didn't deal with. Therefore, all of us, great uh, terrorists of some kind, were, were not acceptable. Second time it happened when I went to Israel, and I wanted to stay in the American colony hotel rather than the Hilton where they wanted to put me. They said that's politically unacceptable. I can't answer for the sins of my forefathers. I'd have been delighted to send you um, where am I? But all I can tell you, I first went to China with the British Council, with the China, uh, the UK China, a communist organisation, the China UK, Peter Field, you probably remember him. And, and things do, things do change. Five, twenty, yeah. Women's images of men, big exhibition here at the ICA, great success. Public gallery in Dublin wants it. The British Council turned it down because the ambassador said this would be embarrassing because there aren't feminists in Ireland. You know, over and over again, I've been invited to Email me, bring it to my attention, I'll have a word with them. Well, you, <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned earlier the, the main issue, and, it's, and there I agree with you, and you talked about our tradition of armed speech. And it seems to me that yes, that, that is fallen apart not only the Foreign Office, but other branches of government and politicians and Parliament itself deems it appropriate. Now, we, we, we denigrate other states when, we, when politicians interfere. But when our government is doing it, by, by making sure that the British Council is really, doesn't have that arm's reach that it should have, that seems to me the danger. And I don't see many people like you in the British Council. And that's what worries me. A lot of people in the British Council will take the money and take all the perks and the children sent to public schools when they're abroad, etc. But they won't dare raise a finger to stand up for some of the things that the artists want them to stand up for. And we're talking about institutions now that are responsible for cultural exchange. And, and I think that is something all of us need to campaign for, is arm's reach, not only British Council, the government, but the it's rampant in society, isn't it? I mean, we, we, you know, what, 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 you know, government has so-called divested itself directly. I mean, we we were part of the Foreign Office, but are no longer. We're a quango. Um, but actually, look at the NHS. I mean, every single branch of our civil society, where organisations which are set up for good socialist reasons, are being privatised because government. And because government funding is seen Hospitals to be are scarce. are being turned into trusts, and they have governors. And I can speak as a governor. So do we. The, the, the British Council is not a charitable trust. Yes, it is. It's a, it acts as a vehicle of government. You have diplomatic status abroad. That the is a charitable trust. It is a charitable trust now. I mean, I, I couldn't agree you? more and with you. And, and let me just defend the title given to me as director of the British Council. I'm not. I'm director of visual arts at the British Council. Um, but of, of, of course, Bill, in, uh, in an ideal world, an organisation such as the one I work in should be standing up to government. And actually, not standing up, I think that's wrong. They should be advising government on how culture is best, um, 
how, how the culture for culture is best grown in this country, instead of, as I think is happening now, and it's happening in many organisations, so I, I hope we're not alone in it, uh, feeling a little bit afraid that if the if they're too independent, the tap will be turned on. I I'm not defending that bill, but I don't think it's probably the argument for this evening for me to be defending publicly the British Council. There's another question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Before we make it speaking, I and vice versa, and there are lots of really interesting stories about that. For instance, Chinese artists who had imagined that the West and Britain would be a kind of utopia for being an artist and getting here and realised how much it costs to buy materials, to do things that you can't get quite cheap labour to make the things for, you know, they had kind of interesting awakenings, which I think naively from our Western standpoints we might not always imagine, but that's kind of not my point. My point really is about this idea of being instrumental, and okay, this is an evening where we're talking about cultural exchange. <coughs> so obviously, that's what we're focusing on: the instrument artists being instrumental to diplomacy. <coughs> However, the way that the institutions in the UK now are trying to make their case as being worthwhile and good value is by making that case economically, and so they're saying no. So there was a, a tweet from GCMS today saying, retweeting something that um, the Heritage Lottery Fund had said about how much, um, how much money heritage generates in the UK. This is GCMS tweeting that. They're simultaneously slashing budgets for the arts. So in terms of in the kind of whole of instrumental, instrumentalization of the arts goes much, much deeper than that. And it's, you can see a project called the Happy Museum, <coughs> which is kind of trying to make the case that museums are good for well-being because of the whole well-being agenda of the communist government. God, that's what I'm saying. That it, you have to be, you know, this whole idea of what is value? What is the value of the arts? What is the value of culture? But it's a creative industry. It's an industry. Well, yes, it is, and no, it isn't. And I, I think it's... Yeah, but no society is value-free, and no society has endless amounts of money to be able to send everybody everywhere at all times, whenever they want, for whatever reason. So judgment has to come into it. When you have judgment, you have <coughs> some criteria about what informs your judgment and decisions. Uh, um, to some extent, and I, I agree with Omar, instrumentalism does come in. I mean, I, I, I don't think art for art's sake is the only thing that art does. I do think it has many dimensions, multiple dynamics, um, and, and again, I use the word disinterested. If organizations which hold funds can be disinterested in viewing how they <coughs> allocate those funds, that, that is a great thing. It is very, very difficult to constantly do that when at the same time, in order to keep those funds, you have to present the sort of um, evidence to paymasters. The only way to relieve yourself of that is not taking government money. Then would we be a richer or poorer society? In my own institution, for example, where um, a great deal of income is generated by teaching English overseas, I think what will happen with the British Council is will become eventually a social enterprise, where all of the revenue earned from English language teaching will eventually fund the arts. But I don't believe that will mean it will be value-free either. I think can I just say, on the bright side, I mean, <laughs> obviously they have, I mean, like all big institutions, there are, there's the bureaucracy, which is absolutely terrible at the British Council, and there are the individuals, and I can vouch for a couple of, of, of Andrea's colleagues in Palestine, who were just amazing, I mean, who braved, you know, all sorts of dangers to, to make things happen for for no other reason than the, the belief in, in what they were doing. On the bright side, you know, so, so just to, to say that I think the problem here is about the form and the dem whether, whether the, the process of funding is democratic enough, um, whether it's transparent <coughs> enough, and whether it, we can actually decrease its sort of bureaucratization. As we were saying before, this is one of the issues with the visa process. It's also the, the, the issues with cultural institutions. On the bright side, there's a lot of exchange going on regardless of the British Council. 
people are, I mean, I disagree that you, you, the, the culture is, is ideology in the sense that it, it pervades everything we do. It's not simply about whether we like Damien Hirst or not. And so that pervades our lives. The, the fact that the, so many people are intermarrying, there's so many people that are traveling, there's so many projects um, happening about English people, Scottish people, British people going to the Middle East and doing projects sometimes at their own expense, and not just vice versa, by the way, this is very important, um, is it's happening. It's happening because people want to do it and they will, it will continue happening. Now, whether that also entails economic exchange can only be beneficial. I mean, we have the right to have equitable exchange of goods, whether they're soft goods or hard goods. The, the, the problem that we face is not whether this is economically viable. The problem is that it's, it's done in an unequal market dominated by armies that force us to do things, force con weak countries to do things which they don't want to do. The well, the British army, the US army, for example, the Israeli army. Yeah. That's one of the problems. You know, so, the, the, so we have to be, uh, that's what, that, for me, that's the problem. Can I just come out? I know that you want to speak, but you yeah. 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 Just, uh, just one thing, right? I think it's really interesting, and I think kind of touched on y your point as well, and it's something about organizations and individuals. Organizations are made up of individuals who have their own beliefs and are committed to the arts in different ways, and that expresses itself in different ways. And I did, you know, I worked for the Arts Council, but I come from more of a museum background. And I suppose when I was there, I was very much about democratization, participation, less about the high quality visual arts. But I knew that my colleague was all about that. So if I was the person there going, yeah, I know, but you know, what about engaging these people? She would be there going, yeah, but frankly, that's just not very good. And it's and I think there's just something interesting in the kind of debate that happens here, where it kind of becomes individuals being almost pitted against organizations. And if you, when you're work, working for an organization like that, you, you sort of walk quite a careful line. And experience comes into it an awful lot. And I think it makes me laugh now, looking back, because I was working for the Arts Council at the time when all of the funding cuts being made and we were having to read. But, and I used to felt this terrible sort of responsibility. And when I had to decide about grants for the arts, I thought, how am I supposed to decide? And I think they've obviously worked my parents are adult education, I grew up in adult education centre. They've obviously worked very hard on their bid. Surely I should give them some money, I'm like, guessing hard. And then I'm sure if I've been there for five years and not just on a maternity cover contract, five years down the line, I've been like, right, I'm not interested, it's not good enough. And I think, yeah, just this kind of dynamic between organisation, individuals, money, because of course money is important, and armies, I mean, yeah, okay, there are, I understand, I'm working on the refurbishment of the National Army Museum at the moment, and you know, we're addressing very interesting questions about... Rosie took part in an art competition in the Occupied Territories under curfew, military curfew. Yeah. It wasn't theoretical. No, no, it's very, it's right. I'm not disagreeing, I'm just saying, you know, yeah. these are things that I don't, my culture I know more about is China, and not can so I, much about Can I just bring in, because in the audience, there's Kathleen Palmer and Sarah Bevan from the Imperial War Museum. And, you know, you've sent artists out to conflict areas as, you know, as a sort of regular basis. But you've, you're you not into the same sort of network of funding because you fund... I mean, has that changed? Or um. you, you, see, you search for funding for every project, don't you, in yes, different... Yes, do. So what, um, what are the political pressures then and that comes, or are there any economic pressure? I mean, how do you relate to this sort of conversation? I mean, I guess we're, in a sense, we're the same as the British Council. We are an arms linked um, government body. So 50% um, of our income comes from these events as a, as a grant and aid. The rest of it is our own earned income. So, you know, we have to balance, um, you know, what kind Um, but, you know, we have a funding agreement with the BCMS that sets out 
spring fruit. Mm. Um, you know, it's not that we get the money and we then can do what we like with it. There is a, an agreement of those things that we, that we are seeking to achieve on Ms. Jennifer's behalf. Wasn't there a deal with Margaret Sanchez that you got some extra money if you celebrated the Falkland War? <laughs> the <No. conscience laughs> is the short answer to that. Well, uh, no. Why did you get such a huge <coughs> grant then, an extra grant that year to do up the Imperial War Museum? Well, that was before just my time, I have to say. <laughs> Not what I heard and I don't think that I would describe what you did as celebrating the Falklands yeah. War either. Um, no, I admire your exhibition, but you did get money from Thatcher to redo the Imperial War Museum. She wanted it done, and it was a huge sum of money written from the arts. That was so before this, I was sorry, this is a there. slightly going off topic. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I do think that's a little off um, topic. I mean, I think Thank you. I would like to hear a bit more. Uh, so far, I don't feel I've been convinced that there is a good case for cultural exchange, and I'm sure there must be, but it can't be. Well, it yes, can't. But. No, let's be clear. I mean, it, it's not. It's not about. I mean, you're not. You're noticing something in London going on now. There are a number of cultural institutions or, or foundation galleries setting up that have their roots in the Middle East. Right? There is a purpose to projecting your, um, your, your cultural activity internationally. Um, I, I'm not, you know, we are, uh, in the West, we are projecting our commercial galleries into the markets of the, of the emerging markets, the art markets of the emerging markets. Um, now, these are all kind of like uh, bean counting uh, kind of arguments. Yes, it, 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 might, it might have a diplomatic effect, it might kind of create a, great, a bit of uh, political goodwill, it might be economically interesting. From, from, from coming from the other side, it may be about brokering influence uh, from emerging markets uh, from those countries into uh, the, 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 you know, the old uh, economies and, and polities of the West. But all right, okay, apart from all that, you know, what's so good about cultural exchange, right? There must be some less boring <laughs> reason uh, for why people communicating each other's cultures uh, or each other's artistic uh, activity from where they are in the world to each other is already anyway a good thing, right? Uh, it feels like we've not really been very passionate or very enthusiastic about making that argument. I mean, I know Andrea has a lot on her <coughs> plate, right? And a lot That's of people... That's all I do. I don't know how no, no, but, but, what you mean. But it's not passionate. What's the... <laughs> apart from it being a, some, some kind of maybe political intervention, what else could it be? No, JJ, I mean, yeah? it, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to answer that question, really, in a nutshell. But um, if I did it anecdotally, I'd say... I, I give the example of a photojournalist I know who went to Afghanistan 25 years ago, 30 years ago, to film Afghanistan before anybody really was during the Mughal uh, regime and before Britain became involved at that stage in sending its army there. And he filmed children in orphanages and was absolutely shocked by what he saw. And he adopted three disabled children and brought them back. He couldn't bring them into Britain because he wasn't allowed, they weren't allowed visas to come back. So he went to settle in France with these children. And what he said was so extraordinary was that children who've been brought up in Afghanistan with a monoculture, with no other knowledge or experience of anything else but the life that they led, were astonished that other religions could coexist. So I think cultural exchange ultimately must be about providing knowledge and information that there is a, not just coexistence, there's a, an enormous coincidence and crossing of different sorts of lives. And having that knowledge makes us richer people. It may, may seem, sound ideological, but I, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't do the job I did. I think if I lived in a monoculture, where only those things which I had been born in, because I happen to believe, be born in Saudi, I have to be a Muslim. Actually growing up, becoming adult, is learning of the complexity of all the different aspects of life and the choices you have to make if you don't offer people choices or if you don't enlighten people about the choices that they then can make for themselves as adults, then I don't think we would be doing our job. But our real job is to make artists do that, because artists provide a view of the world which is uniquely theirs. It isn't a British view, it's an artist's view. And it represents something unique and individual. And I think being able to send that overseas is valuable because it allows other people who don't have rights to individuality and freedoms that we have, whatever the restrictions on our, be our 
visas, we still have un incredible rights and freedoms. And there are many societies, particularly those where our money is, you may say, dirigistly uh, activated, but you know, is, is directed towards don't have those freedoms. So for me, it is providing knowledge, but the knowledge of how individuals experience the world that is valuable. And, and it happens all, I mean, it, it, there's no such thing as a monoculture. I mean, I, I, oh, can, you, can you point me to one? North Korea. North, I, even that, I Iran. mean, I'm, it's very arguable. And it's, it's perhaps a very rare case where somebody, a, a regime has succeeded. But even that, I'm not really sure. I mean, you mentioned Saudi, that's a pretty diverse place. Um, uh, you don't see it, but it is. I mean, there's an ideology which wants to pretend that there isn't, but it's a very diverse country, and I know it very well, and it's diverse ethnically, it's diverse religiously, it's diverse topographically, it's a very diverse culture. But, you know, th th this exchange happens all the time. We would not read Tolstoy in English if it didn't happen. You know, we would not have a lot of our publishing industry if a lot of Germans and Austrians didn't come to the UK uh, as to escape Nazism and, and establish a lot of the cultural institutions and movements here and so on and so forth. And the same goes on with other Europeans and non-Europeans who come here. It happens, it goes on and on. We're, we're tr talking about whether it's worth facilitating or not. Yes, exactly. And, I and I think the model of, of, of promoting British art is uh, abroad is only one model. Absolutely. There is, it's happening in all sorts of ways all the time. Rosie is an example of it. Her father is Palestinian, her mother is Northern Ireland. That's, that's a pretty good start. I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm, both my parents are Palestinian, but look, I sound like, you know, I, I think I sound So all these things are happening just all the take, time. Just to take up your point about Saudi, you say that because you've been and you know it and you have a sort of fundamental understanding of it, how many people in this room do? What we <coughs> read are headlines which are nearly always negative, they're nearly always sensational. Therefore, would it not be a good idea Very to good. see what Saudi artists can say about their society because they probably have an inner life which is freer than many of those who work in government. So I would like to determine for myself what Saudi society is beyond the Daily Mail headlines by seeing the work of Saudi artists. Surely that is, the, that is the point of cultural exchange, however it's mediated. Oh, I agree with you. Well, I think we've reached a, a positive note at just the right time. Um, I'd like to thank Delphina and the ICA for hosting us and for you guys for coming, and particularly all the speakers for entertaining us. Perhaps shopping us too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Thank you.